بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers brother, brother and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you all to the Earth Research Seminar We are pleased today to have Dr. Salman, Salman Sayyid Ali Senior Economist in LT to present his research paper the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. ...and export diversity in OIC countries. Before we start, let me briefly introduce Dr. Salman. Dr. Salman obtained bachelor and master degree in economics from International Islamic University, Islamabad, Pakistan, and PhD in economics from University of Pennsylvania, USA. He also received short-term professional trainings at Swiss Finance Institute and London Business School's Leadership Development Programs. His areas of, uh, of research are Islamic finance, capital market, and game theory. He has a number of uh, publications in, the, in, in these areas. He is active and development, uh, de development of training courses in Islamic finance. Before joint ERT, Dr. Salman served at the, at the International Islamic University of Pakistan, where he was the director of research and director of training in the International Institute of Islamic Economics. Dr. Dr. Salman will present for about how many minutes? 30, 35 minutes. Yeah. For about 30 minutes. After that, we will have a uh, question and, 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 and uh, answer <laughs> session. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Salman to deliver his presentation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you very much for your presence and uh, joining this uh, research seminar. Uh, this is a small and humble effort. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for joining in this uh, seminar. This is a small and humble effort to, to present something. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> So, Allah will live in a shaitan of the deen, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The title of this presentation is Growth, Volatility, and Export Diversity in OIC Member Countries. Uh, let me give you a short background of this, and uh, for which I would like to thank many people. Some for giving me the opportunity to write this paper, and some to help me in doing some econometrics in that. Uh, for op giving opportunity, Dr. Azmi Umar and the Central Bank of Suriname. The background is that there was supposed to be an OIC Central Bank Governors meeting in which there was a panel discussion on trade diversification. So I started just uh, as a panelist, I started reading on those things and then realized that why there is an area in which uh, something can be written. And thanks also for our colleagues, Daud Ashraf and Usman Sek, for providing some input on uh, the econometric side. So let me begin by saying that trade is not only a means for economic growth and economic gains, but it is also a means to bring societies together. Historically, trade has played a very significant role in economic development, information sharing, replication of successful institutions and practices, improved communication and even dissemination of ideas and languages which are more than what is the economic growth thus a fair trade brings diverse people and societies closer to each other this is some important aspect of trade but at the same time trade has also been a source of conflict and wars so trade has this uh, dual role and our focus today is not 
that broader focus of the trade, but uh, looking at one aspect of trade diversification for the OIC countries. If we look at the OIC countries region, uh, we find that uh, it's quite vast. I mean, a fundamental paradigm of economic theory is that stability of growth can be achieved by diversity of economic base and that reflects in scale, scope and diversity of economic activities. But when we look at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation countries that comprises 57 countries, they together constitute a vast portion of the world, stretching from Far East, like uh, Meroke in Indonesia, to <clears throat> Far West, in Dakar, in Senegal, or if you want to extend farther across Atlantic, then even Suriname and Guyana. If you go from north to south, in the north we have Kazakhstan, and in the south, we have Mozambique. Kosol is the last region in Mozambique. So this is a quite large area, home to about 1.6 billion people, uh, constituting 22% of the world population. So it has geographic diversity, diversity of people, etc., etc., and ripe area for trade. But still, the contribution of this group of countries in the world economic activity is small relative to its size and the potential. And the individual economies are in general open to internal and external shocks. Uh, the low level of economic diversification within a country, the small export base, narrow product range, and low diversification of exports make many OIC countries vulnerable to both internal and external shocks. So for example, uh, a fall in export commodity prices, a loss of export market, a crop failure, or any other factor that affects exports can significantly affect the economic growth of individual countries in this region. So the OIC, the, the organization itself, has therefore been using its member and urging its member countries to improve the quantity and quality of their exports, focus on the value addition, promote export diversification, etc. It is also targeting to increase the intra-OIC trade so that the countries can contribute to each other's development. So functioning as a group would be more advantageous than the sum of the individual country performance. So with this background, uh, the present paper focuses on export diversity and its impact on the stability of growth. So focus is very small. Uh, I already talked about that some OIC countries have narrow export base and uh, we are going to look into export diversification. Uh, <clears throat> in general, what I will talk about is OIC countries' facts on exports. I will show you some graphs about diversity of exports base and uh, look at the implications for macroeconomic volatility. We will look into the drivers of diversification. Uh, although I will not cover these lessons from the recent research uh, from Islamic teachings, but I will cover what other research in conventional economics have uh, informed us on diversification of trade, and then we'll come to applying the things on OIC countries. So this graph is showing us exports as a percentage of GDP of many different countries. So you can look in different screens if it is not readable from that. Uh, the countries are listed in alph alphabetical order, not in the amount of trade. And the data that is represented is the black or the gray bars are for 2000 and the red bars are 2014. So these are showing exports as percentage of GDP of each country. Uh, to put things in context, let me draw this line, which is showing the average across the world of GDP uh, exports as a percentage of GDP. So we can see that many OIC countries are above average from the world average as their exports are constituting big portion of their GDP. Hence, the importance of exports for these countries, a, a shock to the export 
can affect the economy. And that's why uh, this analysis for OIC countries will be important. Uh, I can talk about individual countries as well in this, but uh, we'll leave it for later discussion. Uh, this is a graph that I took from one of the databases from IMF. This is showing export diversification map. Uh, the green ones are more diversified. Uh, sorry, the green ones are more diversified. Uh, the, diversi the index is higher than index, <coughs> least diversified the countries. The green ones are least diversified countries in exports. And the, the red ones or the orange ones are more diversified. So we can see that uh, from the map, most of the OIC countries are not that much diversified. Uh, but there are instances of diversification as well. <coughs> <coughs> this chart is giving us uh, an information about export diversification index by looking at the averages across different years, average of, across different countries over different years, by classifying the data among advanced economies, emerging market and developing economies, and the world. So we can see that divergence higher the number, less is the divergence. This is the reverse scale. So we are seeing that overall in the world, divergence is increasing in exports overall. Uh, but there is a consistent pattern also that uh, advanced economies are better. Uh, one more thing that has to be seen over here is that uh, uh, advanced economies are not as diverse as compared to emerging economies. And this is natural. Natural in the sense that uh, as the economies grow, they tend to diverge. But when they grow further, they tend to specialize. And that is something which is uh, evident in the pattern. So observations, findings, and conclusions of some recent research, which are not focusing on OIC, but fo focusing on the world in general, and focusing on less developed countries, so a number of papers from IMF, World Bank, and other institutions have come up, and uh, uh, they are talking about sustaining long-run growth and macroeconomic policies, stability, etc. So what are the conclusions, or what are the things that we, uh, we can uh, glean from them? <clears throat> One observation is that there is a growing but fragmented evidence of the macroeconomic benefits of diversification. Secondly, uh, limited diversification in exports diversification in the trading partners and domestic production has been an intrinsic characteristic of many low-income countries. This is not limited to low-income countries, but many oil exporting countries also face similar problems, despite being not being among the low-income uh, group. <coughs> so diversification is especially important in the early stages of development process. Uh, later on, specialization takes hold. Diversification is also closely related to structural transformation. You will not be able to diversify, diversify the exports while the economy itself is not diversifying. So uh, the macroeconomic diversification of the country itself, export, uh, the economic base itself will have implications for export diversification. We, these two things run hand in hand. Some of the key findings of that other research is that a robust relationship between economic growth and diversification exists for the low-income countries. Increased diversification is associated with a reduction in output volatility. And there is ample room to upgrade the quality of low-income countries' exports, including the agricultural exports, because agriculture is something which is least diversified, but still there are possibilities <laughs> to do that. <coughs> So mostly economists, when they talk about, they talk about this point of policy recommendation that development strategies should emphasize diversification as a way to increase economic growth and reduce output volatility. The diversification should increase, should be increased by improving infrastructure and trade networks and reduce barriers to entry of new products, further improvements in governance, financial deepening, increasing human capital, agriculture reforms, etc. that can provide support. So these are some of the general policy conclusions that we see in the literature. <clears throat> now, 
let's focus on OIC countries uh, and see what is the current position of the OIC countries. And here is the contribution of this paper because other research has not exclusively focused on OIC countries. Uh, before entering into these graphs, let me explain certain things that how this graph is made. Uh, in 2014, IMF released a new data set on export diversification. Uh, it is a new data set in the sense that it is more granular in nature, that they have looked into exports and exports of commodities, individual commodities, at the uh, four-digit commodity identification level, that standard international standard commodity identification numbers that they use. Using four digits means that we will not say the country A is exporting iron, but we can say country A is exporting iron bars or iron bolts or iron ore, what kind of iron it is exporting. And the other countries, how they are importing those. So <coughs> calculating diversify, diversification index become more refined because of this data. And very recently, IMF and other researchers have come up with new papers uh, starting from 2014. So that, but no paper has exclusively looked at OIC countries so far. So this will be, this is something which is <coughs> useful here. Uh, the first graph on your left is showing OIC countries at all income levels. The X axis is GDP per capita and Y axis <coughs> is export diversity. Export diversity over here is measured in the sense of tile inequality. Higher the number, higher the tile index, lesser the country is diverse, more concentration is there. Lower the tile index, better diversification and better diversified the exports are. We can even <coughs> decompose tile in terms of intensive margin, extensive margin. I will come to that later, but over here, this is the total tile or total inequality. As we measure in income inequality, we are measuring inequality of the exports, that how much exports, uh, how to represent using the same formula. So we can see that <clears throat> there is a positive trend line that uh, which is something anomalous, but uh, uh, this is the fact if you look at the OIC countries. And the data that has been plotted is for 57 member countries uh, from 1966 to 2010. Uh, so we have large number of information. Some countries doesn't have all the information all the years, but still it is uh, it's quite a large, large number of information. The graph on the right hand side is again taking X on the X axis export diversification. This is now reversed. And on the Y axis, it is the volatility of the GDP growth. Volatility of the GDP growth measured at constant prices of 1990. So volatility is macroeconomic volatility is measured on y-axis and export diversification on the x-axis. And <clears throat> now we can see uh, that a pattern is emerging. That as if it is a U-shaped curve that uh, as you are increasing the export diversification, volatility of exports are going down. And then after a certain state, it is going up. So meaning that there is no uh, linear relationship, there may be non-linear relationship that we can expect and so our task is to decipher what is that relationship. <clears throat> well, this is the same graph, but made more focused uh, in the sense that on the left hand side, you can see orange and blue dots where I have tried to differentiate between low income and high income countries. Uh, the orange dots are the countries which are not least developed member countries according to the classification of IDB. Here I'm using the IDB classification. IDB classifies for its analysis some countries as least developed member countries, others as non-least developed member countries. So the red ones are not least developed countries and the blue ones are the least developed countries in the left hand graph. So you can see that uh, same on the y-axis, the volatility of the growth on x-axis export diversity. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a distinction, 
uh, some difference in the in the shape of the among diversity among the low income countries as well as among the um, non low income countries on the right hand side this is same graph but without any uh, differentiation between uh, which is what uh, gdp growth volatility of export diversity oic countries yearly from 1966 to 2000 let's go one step deeper into the analysis and try to decompose the thai index export diversification can be measured across products and across for partners country a is exporting product 1 2 3 <laughs> if they start exporting product 4 meaning that they have diversified across the products country a was exporting products to two countries two trading partners if they add another trading partner again it is a kind of diversification because what happens to one if there is a shock from one partner they can still uh, be in the top of the shock so the export diversification can be measured in two ways across products as well as across partners and within each category across products you can measure extensive margin and intensive margin extensive margin is that increase in the number of new export products or partners an intensive margin is increase in export volume of existing products or existing partners let me give an example uh, for extensive uh, for uh, intensive margin for example country a was exporting to partner 1 and partner 2 and partner 3 to partner 1 and partner 2 it was exporting 40% 40% of the trade and partner 3 it was exporting only 20% now if it is exporting to everybody 33.333% it has become more diversified in that sense of intensive margin that increasing the export volume across creating more balance so when you are creating more balance it is intensive margin when you are adding new product or new partner then this is the extensive margin so we can divide thai index decompose thai index into these two uh, the intensive margin uh, and extensive margin and we can redraw try to redraw those, those graphs okay by the way this data is again taken from imf and uh, the definition is that uh, a new product that were not exported in the last 2 years and started to export and continue to be exported for next two years then they are taking it as a export diversification measure it is not that the country is exporting today one thing and dropped out again tomorrow something has happening and dropped out then it is not a stable measure so let's look at the oic countries <coughs> so most of this presentation will be showing through the graphs and uh, trying to visualize what is the pattern of diversification across oic countries and in the end we will come at the econometric analysis uh, these are the averages of different regions like idb classifies countries according to their development status idb also classifies countries according to the region for example sub saharan africa mena region countries in transition and the asia these are the four classification that idb uses uh so the red bars are for the country the sub saharan african region the gray bars are for the mena region the uh, yellow bar is for uh, countries in transition that is the newly independent countries in the uh, in the russian federation and the blue bars are for the asia and these are average across decades the first on the left hand side is the average from 1981 to 1990 the second in the middle the block is from average of 1991 to 2000 and the third block is average of 2001 to 2010 so we can see there is there has been change diversification is improving in the sense that this these bars are 
going down. If you look at, if you look across MENA, for example, the gray, uh, from, from the decades of 90, situation has become better. That, that situation has increased. But across the past two decades, the, there is not much change. If you look at Asia, same pattern that uh, from compared to 1990s, much diversification has uh, taken place. But if we compare the decade of 2000 with uh, decades of uh, this decade as compared to the last decade, there is not much change. In, in the CIT, uh, there is a reverse that uh, in, the first, in the first decade, these countries were not existing as independent countries, so there is no bar for it. But in the second and third, we can see that their diversification has reduced. What are the reasons for that? I have not gone into that detail, but people who are in this area of research can point out as a discussion. Those graphs were the averages. Now these are year by year. Uh, what is happening to the overall trade diversification in these regions? So Asia is the yellow, the lowest one. Um, throughout the, from 1993, well, from 1993 and onwards, it has been the most diversified region. And uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the least diversified region uh, with others in between. And as we can see that uh, the CIT country, which is gray over here, uh, has uh, shown in the beginning improved diversification, but after, but for some reason afterwards, their diversification decreased. Uh, people who are working in uh, on those countries can point out. Uh, I'll skip this graph. And uh, again, the previous graph was showing us comparison across uh, different regions. This graph is showing comparison across least developed member countries of IDB and the uh, other member countries of IDB, which are not least developed in the least developed classification. And we can see that uh, for the least developed countries, uh, the diversification index is going up, meaning that their diversification is going down. And uh, whereas for non-least developed member countries, their situation is improving. And there have been periods which, uh, which were in one group was performing better than the other in some, uh, some years. If we classify countries according to oil exporting countries and non-oil exporting countries, then this is the situation. Oil exporting countries are all up, up and non-oil exporting countries, this is average of those countries is down, uh, showing that uh, oil exporting countries are least diverse as compared to the other OIC member countries. Now, what we are trying to do over here is trying to see in this graph, uh, the relationship between extensive margin and intensive margin. On the x-axis, we have extensive margin of diversification. On the y-axis, we have intensive margin of diversification. So as you can see that there is a negative pattern that if you are going to increase the intensive margin, then your extensive margin is affected. If you improve the extensive margin, then intensive margin is affected. Uh, I tried to color the dots in blue and green and different colors. So this is extensive versus intensive margin. Uh, yearly cross-section by region in the wise countries. The yellow dots are for Asia. Red dots are for the MENA. Blue dots for Sub-Saharan Africa. And the gray dots for countries in transition. So again, the similar pattern is evident, but uh, we are getting more information from here that uh, uh, MENA is less diversified, Sub-Saharan Africa is less diversified as compared to Asia, but uh, not only uh, less diversified or more diversified, but what kind of diversification we, we can see. And if you look at uh, this side uh, on, the, on the near the <coughs> vertical axis, all gray dots are on the near the Y axis, showing that these countries, the countries in transition, although they were good from the point of view of extensive margin, but they are not as good in, from the point of view of the intensive margin. Uh, they are exporting to very limited number of partners.
Over here, I tried to plot the same dots of uh, overall export diversification with real GDP growth rate. And we can see that there is a clear distinction between one group of countries as compared to the other. Uh, so these are certain patterns that are emerging. Uh, the graphs over here are showing that not only the GDP growth affect export diversification, but also increase in export diversification can affect the growth in the GDP. Uh, these, this is not a uh, hard econometric analysis. It is simply a graphical representation of looking at uh, some patterns. In these two graphs also, extensive versus intensive margin, and uh, this, the y-axis is showing intensive margin, x-axis is showing extensive margin. Uh, but on the left-hand graph, you can see this is least developed member countries versus non-least developed member countries, uh, which are in red is the non-least developed member countries, and the uh, red are the least developed member countries, and blue are the non-least developed member countries. So we can see that uh, the, the, the variation or range of variation for the least developed member country is much larger as compared to uh, the countries which are more developed in, in terms of export diversification. And if you look at the right hand graph, we see relation, uh, comparison between oil exporting and non oil exporting countries. And again, uh, that diversification thing is evident, but it is giving more information that what kind of diversification. Uh, so in both extensive and intensive margin, uh, oil exporting countries are not performing that well as compared to non-oil exporting countries. But the dilemma is that uh, oil exporting countries, if in terms of volume of trade, it is much larger as compared to the other countries which are. So now, I am done with presenting the situation of the OLC countries, how they look on the graphs, how, what is the pattern of export diversification. Uh, now I come to the econometric analysis that uh, the task over here is to find out what is the magnitude of this relationship, what is the magnitude of impact of export diversification on the volatility of growth. The idea is that uh, uh, more open an economy is, more it can be affected by exogenous shock in the export sector. More open an economy is, larger will be, be it's maybe is expected to be GDP because it is, uh, uh, it has increased, increased its uh, market. It is not relying only on the domestic market, but also on the extent, uh, on the external market. So what will happen is that any shock in the outside world can affect the domestic country if the economy is open. Adverse shock can affect the economy adversely. But the point is that if the economy is more diversified, the export sector is more diversified, then the impact of this shock will be beneficial. I mean, uh, impact of shock will be absorbed better and impact of any positive shock will be utilized for the betterment of the growth. So on one side, you will be able to absorb the sh negative shocks. At the other side, you will be able to take advantage of the available opportunities if your economy is open as well as diversified. So these two things will go together. Uh, so in order to quantify the relationship, uh, uh, we are using the following single equation model that on the left hand side, it is the volatility mm -hmm. of the GDP. On the right hand side, our variable of interest is the DEX, this is the uh, diversity of export. This is our variable of interest. But of course, many other things are, are going to affect the diversity of export. Uh, many, uh, many changes in 
many changes in many other variables can affect the volatility of the GDP on the left-hand side. So we need to control for other factors as well. So in order to control for those other things, we have added certain things on the right-hand side. Uh, for example, this X, X is a set of control variables uh, like exchange rate, changes in exchange rate, inflation, uh, terms of trade, uh, openness of the economy, all these things can affect the volatility of the GDP growth. While these are not our primary concern, so but we have to control for that, so these X is representing those. But we also know that volatility of GDP today, or variation in GDP today, will also depend upon the pattern of the economy, that what were the shocks before, how the GDP was performing in the previous years. So we cannot ignore V GDP in the T minus one. So that's why it has also come on the right hand side. And this model, this equation or the data that we are using is not of one country, but many countries and not of one year, but from 1966 until 2010. So meaning that this is a panel as well as, which is of diversified countries as well as the time series. So this is a kind of, uh, 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 this is a pooled panel, <coughs> pooling of time series and cross-section data, and uh, which will have some econometric problems that we will face, uh, which can make our estimation inconsistent uh, bias parameters. The other thing that has to be noted over here is that this is a dynamic panel, dynamic in the sense that uh, vol volatility of GDP today depends upon the GDP volatility of GDP yesterday as well. So uh, if we want to make anything measurable, then the parameter alpha should not be explosive and parameter alpha has to be controlled in order to get our interested in result of interest, which is beta. So there are details on that. So in general, the, uh, the result I summarize in this red that export diversity contributes between 11 to 16 percent volatility of the growth in the OIC member countries as a group. Uh, this is from the uh, from the econometric thing that we I'll show you those things. That so, so the uh, there are various problems that we face in this model that uh, since this is a dynamic panel, there is a built-in endogeneity between the left-hand side and the right-hand side variables. Uh, this can lead to inconsistent estimates. Uh, solution can be, can be found through data restructuring, a use of, uh, I don't know, bond method, or trying to do certain other further innovation in the, in the, in the estimation techniques. We will do all those things. Uh, again, DEX is the diversification of exports. We are measuring thigh as a measure, but we will be measuring, we will be estimating this equation three times using three different, uh, three different measures of diversification. Once using the total diversification, next looking at the between thigh, which was the intensive margin, and then uh, between within thigh. So, so that we can, see the effect and X is a set of control variables which are exchange rate volatility, inflation, openness calculated over here as exports plus imports divided by GDP and interaction of openness with the diversification to capture any non-linearity in the estimation. So this is what is the idea. Uh, this is a simple estimation without any control. This is simply a two-stage least square uh, without controlling for the endogeneity problems and we can see what are the results that uh, our variable diversity of exports which is total thigh B2 is coming significant if I re-estimate the same model by taking between thigh which is the extensive margin the, the stars are showing the the level of significance is a significant if I take uh, diversity of extensive margin that is within thigh then again, there is some number, but it is not significant. And uh, what we are expecting is that we are expecting that uh, more diversified exports are, lesser should be the volatility. 
So meaning that we expect this coefficient to be positive because our thyl is measuring things in a reverse manner. That positive, higher thyl means lower diversity. So this significance should be, uh, this, uh, this uh, coefficient should be positive. So this is what we are getting. Uh, I will not waste your time or uh, put you in trouble. You can read the paper for that. But now in this, this is a second estimation. Uh, this is same, no, this is second estimation in which, yeah, this is same estimation which, in which I try to highlight that what, where we are focusing. This is the second estimation. This is the estimation with generalized movement of, uh, generalized method of movement <coughs> so that we can uh, control for some degree of that uh, uh, biasness that can come up because of the endogeneity problem. And uh, <coughs> we can see that our results are, we are getting positive signs over here positive signs over here, but when we put control variables, we start getting, uh, it's still it's positive sign, so this is good. But when we add the variables openness as well as diversity, then our signs become problematic, that uh, where we are expecting positive, we get negative, for example, over here, column number one, two, three, four. If you look at column, fourth column, uh, and uh, look at the coefficient of B2 on the fourth column, it is negative while we were expecting positive. Similarly, B3, B4, uh, similarly this B6, B6 prime, B6 double prime, we are also getting <clears throat> some significant, some non-significant results. And this is because even though we are controlling for uh, endogeneity, but the way we have created uh, the variable, it is a, we are calculating standard deviation of volatility is measured in the standard deviation of we are, we, are, we are measuring it in terms of the rolling average of standard deviation, ro rolling uh, standard deviation by a moving window. So meaning that we are taking past values into consideration and which may be a source of endogeneity itself. So here my colleagues helped me to, to look into some other way, which I will present in the end lecture. This is the other way. In this estimation, what we did, <coughs> instead of taking a moving window standard deviation, we divide the entire data into group of five years period and calculate the standard deviations of the volatility of export, volatility of uh, GDP, volatility of inflation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for those five non-overlapping periods. So, in that sense, it is uh, we are restructuring the data to 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 control for endogeneity problem, and in this we get much better results. Uh, much better results in the sense that they are more uh, we can rely on the on the significance and unbiasedness of the of the result, but the main conclusion I have already explained earlier is this: that export diversity contributes between 11 to 16 percent volatility of growth in the OLC countries, and uh, I have done this thing for individual uh, groups of countries: oil exporting, non oil oil exporting, and LDCs and non LDCs across regions, etc. But I will not bore you on that uh, because these are all econometric things. Uh, let me come to the limitation of this thing. The limitation is that uh, the missing aspect is that the data is limited only to, uh, to the tradables. We are not looking at the services, uh, trading services, although this also contributes a, a much significant proportion of OIC country trade. <laughs> Uh, policy option we can talk about in different manners, but uh, uh, policy option people can talk about uh, that uh, we have to focus on diversity, focus on this thing, that thing. Uh, we can go into detail, but uh, I want to bring your attention to something else. 
And that's something else is that uh, trying to improve export diversity without trying to improve the diversity of the overall economy doesn't work. If it works, it is not sustainable. In order to create diversity in exports, we have to work on the structural reform or structural changes in the economy itself and uh, defining and setting the correct goals, reforming reforms of the thinking, institutional reforms in the governance, doing business, serving people, cooperation and brotherhood, accountability. All these things will be important because they are important for the long run. Whatever policy conclusions from economic and direct economic, economic analysis or very narrow economic analysis that we can get, like this econometric thing, is that you can ask, you can say that uh, somehow the cost of exports have to be decreased, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the problem lies somewhere else, the, the deep rooted problem. So those problems should also be addressed when we are looking at the short term solutions. We also have to look for the long term solutions, and these are some important long term solutions. So I think this is the gist of the paper, but it opens up some other things that uh, is open for future work that we would like to do and uh, that I just uh, put over here for your consideration and maybe thinking and uh, other people can also contribute. That This was economic analysis that we have done so far. Are there any guidance from Quran and Sunnah also that we can, although Quran and Sunnah will not be guiding you to micro aspects but uh, some overall guidance that we can get that we can base on uh, there are two things that uh, strike struck me that uh, when i read it seems that there are two preconditions for growth of exports and for gdp uh, if you look at uh, surah al quraish we find those two preconditions that uh, um, uh, freedom from hunger and uh, provision of security because these are the two things which Allah mentions as a ihsan or as a bestownment on Quraysh that uh, they should revert back to, uh, to to worship the Lord of that house because their trade was based on that they were able to diversify trade across seasons across commodities and why that was because they were saved from hunger and uh, they were uh, they were saved from fear. Their caravans were not, not affected when they were moving with, for trade, while other tribes were not that much free in doing that business. And uh, when you read the history, you find that this is not in the period of uh, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, but even much before that, that something started that initially uh, because of the Kaaba, people were coming in to trade and their hosting of the hajis provided them this uh, goodwill and protection. So their hunger was eliminated because of trade coming in. Later on, they start to bring the trade, take the trade out by the caravans. And it was much more diversification. And that was possible because of the protection that they enjoyed. So this is one thing that uh, these are two preconditions that we get. So these are the long-term things that we have to focus on if you want to. This is further strengthened by another aspect in uh, uh, chapter 16 of uh, and ayah 112 of, of Quran, when Allah the Billah and the Shaitan kanat aminatan mutmainatan yatiha riskuha ragadan min kulli makani kafarat bi anumillah fa adaqah Allah. So again, Allah is mentioning those two things. In the previous, it was mentioning those two things as a father that created their livelihood. And over here, when he Allah wanted to destroy a nation, these were the two things that it was imposed on that. So hence the importance of these two aspects that uh, we have to focus on. And uh, so these two instances taken together spell out the necessary conditions for growth and trade, freedom from hunger and freedom from, uh, from fear. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we should be mindful that uh, the growth is not the only objective. If it becomes the only objective, then it is a wrong objective because uh, it will be that 
wa anna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-kafirin so as a muslim our focus should be al akhirah but these things will come in because of these taking care of these two things so thank you very much and floor is open to questions and i have i brought some papers over here also this is a, i think eight copies anybody interested can take the papers the paper is discussing only the econometrics not the the other side Thank you, Thank Dr. Salman, for your uh, informative uh, presentation. Now we open the floor for any questions or comments. <coughs> Let me so cut you short in this. Yes or no? It's GDP. No. Uh, yeah, maybe we are missing the point. Okay, because what I understood is that uh, maybe you are uh, you thought in, in different manner that the paper is not about growth. It is about what is the impact of export diversification on the volatility of growth, the stability. Okay. You are not testing the volatility of the GDP. Yes. You are testing the volatility of the growth of GDP. Yes. So we are back to growth. Okay. We are ultimately are talking about growth. We are talking about the stability of growth. Growth. So and this growth. Okay. Okay. So the word growth doesn't. Cost domestic at the end of the day is growth cost domestic. Okay. While uh, the other part is exports. I'm not sure we are uh, putting uh, apples and oranges or apples. Yeah, it is easy to measure the usually uh, in the literature it is measured in the sense of standard deviation uh -huh. over a period. Okay. You take the GDP growth, uh, year, year by year growth rate of GDP, let's say for five years, uh -huh. and try to find out what is the standard deviation of that uh, growth rate. If growth rate of the economy today was 5%, tomorrow it is 6%, then it is 4%, 3%, you can get a standard deviation. So that standard deviation will be will serve as a volatility of the growth, measure of volatility of the growth. Another country which is experiencing that 6% today, but minus 6% tomorrow, and again 6% uh, next year, uh, it will have higher volatility of the growth, higher standard deviation, so higher volatility. So we are not looking only at the GDP growth rate, but we are looking at how much vari variation we get. So that's why I was disputing with Brother Sami that uh, we are not, our focus is not the growth. Our focus is how the growth is fluctuating year over year. Is there a relationship between the volatility and the level of growth? Volatility and? and the level. level of growth. There can be. There can be, of course. But I have not, uh, because uh, uh, not only the level of growth, but it can also depend upon the level of GDP that. Uh, as I showed you in the, in the graph earlier, that countries which are more developed, they tend to specialize rather than diversify. So there can be. But the point of this model over here is not to explain what, uh, uh, it is not explanatory model. It is a model in which 
which is trying to see that uh, what is the impact of diversity on the export volatility the, the objective was very very small it is not a uh, wide objective to what are the determinants of the volatility of growth if i was uh, if the purpose was that then of course of course those things can be added as control variables over here that uh, to control for it would have two different implications you want to find the thing that diversifying the economy of life and by extending your, your export increasing the complex <laughs> the economy on the one hand but on the other hand you could also speak about specialization and the economy of and so on and developing the financial system to the extent that it could withstand such extended shocks uh, that comes from the terms of trade and so on yeah. which could completely be a different uh, it can be added. We'll take care of that uh, in maybe in future. But as uh, on in, this, in this model, those things are not uh, addressed. When you use uh, GMM with this AV method, yeah. then you try to control for that uh, cross dependence. Endogeneity, just endogeneity, not uh, between the Endogeneity, you, you control for, and you also control for, if I'm not sure about the cross dependence, but yeah. uh, you control for uh, the cross sectional effects, but not cross dependence. Yeah. Cross sectional effects you, you, you control for. So if you can suggest anything, then I'm not an econometrician. I take help of the econometricians yeah. on that. Any comments? Any? No comments? Questions? Table one. Can you can you open the mic? In the table one, I don't see Saudi Arabia. Is there any special reason for that? No, I don't think so. There is a in my table it, is, it was there, but maybe when you let me come one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It is there, but uh, it is not visible. In because uh, when you try to do Excel graph with fifty-six countries, it's sometimes it uh, hides certain things. So if I open my computer, I will be able to tell you later on where is Saudi Arabia, but it will be there because I took the data for all fifty-six countries. I think you compared uh, oil and oil, uh, it was original uh, classification, etc. But uh, I think it would be better if you put IDV average or OIC average uh, to see. Okay. Yeah, to, to get smart with, uh, with, with other regions or even with the uh, classifications and current classification and like developing countries and uh, developed countries with IDV average to see how IDV fares. 
Okay, so instead of uh, the world average, yeah. I can also use yeah. the OIC average for that so to, to see how they can do I saw some negative coefficients and positive coefficients uh, for uh, <coughs> expert clarification. I mean, can you explain why we are having sometimes negative, sometimes positive correlation? And, and what would be the, the true Okay. Uh, it will need further analysis, but there are some explanations that we came up with that. I'm not sure whether those explanations are the only explanations, but there are. One is that uh, in, the, in, the, in the table that is in the paper or in, the, in those graphs, um, the way the data was constructed in the initial model was it was taking moving standard deviation for a window of five years. So when you are doing this thing, you are adding inconsistency, uh, you are adding past dependence, and uh, the estimates can become biased, and this kind of negative relationship is possible because of that, because of that data problem. The second thing that we uh, see is that uh, the interaction, this negative thing is not coming unless, until you bring in openness and openness diversification, you interact both. So since those, these two things are interrelated, so there can be a, the non-linearity can show up in different manners in the, in the, in the coefficients. So this is uh, something which is showing up over here, which we have to separate out. That's why in the last model, uh, we changed the, the method of data aggregation. That instead of taking moving averages, I took fixed windows for five years. Then this reversing of sign is not visible, is not taking place. Uh, and also I used uh, the AB method for that calculation. Um, so my hunch is that uh, it is because the way we, we created that, uh, that, that restructuring, it created endogeneity in itself, which was not corrected by which was not sufficiently corrected by GMM even when we are using AB method in the first models. So this may be one reason. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Brother Smalsek was suggesting that it's maybe because of the collinearity that we are see seeing. So we have not investigated in deep that what is the, the main reason for that, but uh, this is the hunch that uh, we are getting. So what is the conclusion? No, no. Overall, it it is increasing, but as you see that uh, export diversification reduces the volatility. This is there, but uh, uh, all the coefficient, uh, the when you add non-linear terms, then your results are not that, uh, that uh, become suspicious. And this is another thing that I want to present uh, or uh, I should have uh, emphasized that when some other research with the same data, when it was done with uh, for the le uh, less uh, low income countries, not YC, but low income countries, they are also getting anomalous results. But there is, uh, the research that has been conducted earlier using other data, not this kind of uh, this uh, new four digit data, but uh, less number of digits or um, coarser data, then they are getting very strong results, very strong positive coefficients. So, this research or this paper is also showing that those strong results may be suspicious because when you increase increase the granularity of the data, when you go you measure the uh, diversity with a finer measure, the relationship is not that straightforward. 
which was appearing in all the past papers there are many papers that has been uh, that has been written up till uh, 2012 or 2013 but with the other data which were not using that uh, four digit classification which were using simply uh, the herfindahl index or they were using some aggregate uh, export data so with the final export data the results for yc are not that uh, strong and the results for low income countries which id which the world bank has tried to do are also not that strong but uh, so this is also opening up a, a, a an area that uh, the earlier research uh, can be questioned because of this result uh, i want to comment a little bit on uh, dependency that you were talking about initially in the model when you have the moving windows and the fixed windows and address a little bit the sister's comment on uh, taking care of uh, cross sectional dependence in the estimation uh, number one the, the the window i mean initially what the data was that i was using a little bit on is that you were looking at the volatility but by calculating the standard deviation for the last five years and then the previous time period it was for the last five years which means that for 2000 if you are calculating the volatility for 2005 you are using data for 2005 2004 2003 2002 and 2001 and you are calculating the variance and then for 2004 you are taking again 2004 i mean you are taking four of the variations in the two calculations which means that there is of course you will have dependence on that which means that if you run it on a model you will have some very, very strong relationship but it doesn't mean that the volatility depend on the previous volatility it just mean you have the same number of same like you have almost the same composition of the two values so uh, that's why i mean we suggested what the uh, taking five windows let's say 2000 to 2005 and then that volatility compared to the volatility between 1995 and 2000 uh, and i think that after that you know it was kind of better uh, the other problem is that when you take the volatility like with just five years five years five years you end up with a model which is almost like 40 time series and some kind of cross section and for that whether you use gmf or to say to square whatever you use it won't work because those models are for short time and long cross section but this is long time and short cross section uh so but i think that the last time the last model that he presented had just about nine or nine time series and more cross section <coughs> now for the cross-sectional dependence you usually cannot do it just by using an estimation method because you need to have a rationale for saying why you have a cross-sectional dependence for example if you have Saudi Arabia you might have cross-sectional dependence with let's say countries that trade with Saudi Arabia or some, some countries that are close to Saudi Arabia either geographically or in the same like economic partners so one way to do it is to consider something like a, you know a distance variable like two add additional variables that measure that capture the relationship between let's say one country a and another country b and that way you can use gmm2 and you know have a consistent estimate now i mean sometimes we focus on the methods but for something like this we use small number of observation even ols would work even though you have endogeneity because when you have an endogenous variable there is no way to have something that is not biased any estimated that you use would be biased whether you use gmm whether you use two stage b square whatever you are using if you have endogeneity it's going to be biased but you solve the problem if you have a large data set because the estimator would be consistent meaning the larger the data the closer the, the smaller the bias but you know for this we don't really have a lot of data points so basically you are saying i mean the benefit of having the state gmm for two stage the square you will only get it with a large data set which we don't have so i think that just like an oils 
and uh, maybe a two stage B square with some distance variable would work fine. I mean, you, you are just looking for qualitative information. Actually, I'm not sure about the data because what we have from the data is how to take care of the data from that. Yeah, but you have a lot of missing data. You have a lot of missing values. Okay. So the total was about one. And how do you control for the missing values? But there is no way, I mean, you can't control for missing values. Yeah, you can't filter or you filter or what? No, you can't filter. I mean, you have software that will fill it up, but basically. Yeah, I mean, just ask you know, how you how you control for this missing values. You, no, missing values, you just, if missing values, sometimes if you, any missing value would be dropped from the line, like yeah. that row would be yeah. dropped. Yeah. But so for some countries, you might have maybe three periods, three observations, or for some others, you, can't, you might have more. But, you know, usually I have a lot of, like, um, you know, a lot of uh, reservation about whether you should, like, kind of, simulate the number itself to fill the missing value or whether you, you know what you should do usually i mean some problems like you know enough data they don't have really a solution they have i mean uh, i just suggest this question then just because i thought like the data is big okay and you have many <coughs> countries okay so you need to take into account this process to the limit. Yeah, we don't have a lot uh, of Of course, there is a rational difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't do it like this as you want to take it. Because this, the, what is, uh, this topic is about diversification and the work we did. And he mentioned this in his presentation. As the country is open, it will be more affected by the part in the country, for example. In this case, maybe he needs to show the trade markets, for example. Well, uh, can I, can I inter uh, enter in the discussion? I mean, your idea of uh, cross-section dependence may be important, mm. but there is also a fact that uh, if you look at, uh, this will be important if the trading partners are within YC countries. Yeah. But the fact is that less than 20% of the trade mm. is intra-YC. In fact, 15% of the exports and about uh, uh, 14 or 13 percent of the imports, or 15 percent of the imports and uh, 14 percent of the exports, something like that, are intra OIC. The rest is with the other countries. So that interdependency problem, if it is, it is small in nature. It is not that uh, significant. We take one question through the okay. So the question is that, do you have studies on the state of Makazas of Sharia application in IDB member countries? Can Makazas study on economy uh, be done on export diversity? Uh, I don't think we have any study on that from Makazas of Sharia point of view. If you can do it, uh, very welcome. And please suggest us something. Although, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank you all for your uh, attendance and support. Inshallah, we hope to see you again in our next uh, seminar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you.